Okay, it's day 29 of this sweet potato germination experiment. And as you can see, the leaves have turned green in just one day. Now, they were still very purple yesterday. And, you know, 48, 72 hours ago, they were basically all purple. And everything was a lot smaller. So this uh, vegetative structure is huge. You know, that's just the top of the sweet potato, but... You know, the volume of this structure is already greater if you kind of put a bag around it than the entire sweet potato itself, which is uh, quite amazing. So let's do a leaf count. Um, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's just the ones you can count. Um, let's see. There's just so much activity going on. Um, let's see, you know. So, I think we should do a leaf count. Um, my first attempt, which I don't show here, was quite embarrassing because this structure is so complex and it's so robust and productive. You know, so I think I can establish that this and this, these are cotyledons, so you can count those as, uh, well, two cotyledons. It's a dicot, and basically the leaves are dull, and they're, con they're uh, convex, whereas uh, these uh, true leaves are very shiny and concave and perfectly heart-shaped. So that's definitely a big difference there that we can tell now. So if we try to count true leaves you know that's one okay if we're just trying to count true leaves here that's one Let's see that's two three four five six seven come around this side it's just way too many things to count 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, um, wow, you know, uh, I guess this is like 18, 19, um, 20, 21, 22, 23, and I think I, didn't even count that one, that's 24. You know, this is just an impossible task because there are multiple meristems just generating so many leaves at the same time. This is not at all like honeydew where you basically can count very, very easily or, you know, many other plants. It's very straightforward, but not here. So this is uh, fascinating. So there's actually a lot of leaves I didn't count. You know, that's another meristem. Um, let me get a good zoom on that. That's another meristem. You know, there's just way too many leaves to keep track of. And, you know, basically all I'm going to do here is show you, um, you know, the intricate beauty of these uh, meristems and... You know, this is just way too complex to figure out compared to honeydew. So I would say there might be 30 to 40 true leaves already, or in development. And, you know, there are these, like, little springtails crawling all over these, but, you know, I think their days are numbered with all the sand in the pot. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, everywhere you look, there's just more and more meristems pumping out leaves. So 30 to 40 true leaves is a good estimate. Um, pretty soon I won't even be able to count at all at this rate. So I'm just going to give up. And, you know, there's uh, two cotyledons. Yeah, so look at the complexity of this. There's just way too many structures uh, having activity at all at the same time. A sweet potato tuber contains a few hundred kcals, 
So the calories you eat are actually not singular calories. What they actually mean is uh, thousands of calories. So for instance, if the sweet potato tuber in the background, if it had, let's just say 250 calories on a nutritional label, that actually means 250,000 calories. And you know, calorie equals 4.18 joules. You know, that's basically a, almost more than a million joules. And what that means is, you know, a joule is the metric unit for work. Basically, it's equal to, you know, let's, I'll just say, you can take one kilogram rock and kind of push it in space in a frictionless environment. And, you know, if you keep applying one joule every second, it would accelerate by another, you know, increase its velocity by one meter per second. So after 10 seconds, you know, that rock is going at 10 meters per second of speed, which is one one hundred thousandth of uh, the energy contained in this tuber. So basically, you could accelerate a small rock up to an incredible speed in space. But, you know, for us, it just means there's a lot of capacity for work. Um, you could eat a sweet potato... And, you know, do a fair bit of weight training as a big muscular guy and move around a lot of iron for a lot of repetitions with that amount of energy. And your body can do many other things too, such as uh, mount an immune response to sickness. You know, um, you generate body heat. So because plants have a lot less maintenance, they don't move, they don't have muscles, and they stay at the same temperature as the environment generally, um, they save a lot of energy and because they're producing structures, all of their structures in the shoot system photosynthesize, that generates, begets more energy and basically that's why plants can grow huge and their trees are much bigger than the biggest animals by far and they grow a lot faster. Okay, it's day 32 of this potato germination experiment. So as you can see, the growth compared to 72 hours ago is already enormous. So what I just did is I put some new sand down. I still had a fungus gnat problem. I believe there just wasn't enough sand, particularly around the edges, because when you move this bowl and it's not very full, you know, the sides are a soft plastic. They compress and wobble, so that creates cracks in the sides that a fungus gnat larvae can emerge from as flies. So what you can see here is this bud is the second one to germinate that we can see of and it's developing a first leaf. So it's very fortunate that we're getting to see this structure in its infancy and as you can see the leaf is wet, the sand is wet, I sprayed a lot of water because uh, sweet potato leaves are you know a little bit coarse. Um, they don't really seem to have you know hairs on them but they gather and stick to sand very very easily or rather the sand grains stick to them so what we see here is a leaf and since sweet potato is a dicot growing from tubers you know I expect two cotyledons um, this could be the first one and you can also see several other um, branches growing out of it already so the development of this plant is a very alien in my experience to compared to say honeydew. So in the middle of this is the shoot apical meristem and you know it's generating so many leaves you know I think there's at least six going on there if not more. Even here you can see another meristem developing other true leaves. So the sweet potato truly is a very fast developing plant due to all the resources provided to give it a very fast head start you know, from uh, the tuberous root that it grows from. Most of the foliage has turned green at this point, and only the stems and petioles somewhat remain purple. So let me just rotate this round to give you a feel for what everything looks like. So this structure is just so big compared to what it was 72 hours ago. And you know, I'm not recording every day like I used to with honeydew because I just have too much work to do, too many projects. One thing I've noticed are these little bumps on the side of the stem. 
And at first, you know, the sand got all over this, somewhat wet sand. And it was sticking everywhere, and I just thought this was sand, but it's not. And, you know, in humans, like, you'd think these were, like, some kind of warts or whiteheads or something, but I'm not quite sure what to make of this. Um, I'm assuming everything is healthy and this is not some disease, or rather it's just some natural process or morphology of these uh, plants. So unlike honeydew, which is a vine, sweet potato grows more like a regular plant. You know, it has stiff structural support in its stem, which is thick and already very robust in a very short period of time. So it's generally just not that flexible. It is flexible, but you know, it won't fall over on its own unless there's really strong forces being applied. And there's no shoot apical meristem dominance where it's using oxen to suppress every other meristem. It just seems like every single place um, between a petiole and the stem is generally just uh, a meristem that's unregulated and can generate as many leaves as it wants. So. Here's an example of what I'm talking about over here. This is the petiole, this is the purple stem. Petioles are these little stem-like structures that lead to leaves. And in each junction, you basically have a meristem. So in honeydew, those would be suppressed, but that's not the case here. So growth is just wild and unchecked. It's very interesting. And at this rate, this plant is almost gonna fill up this entire pot in a few days. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, I'm still waiting for the other potatoes to germinate, the gold potato and the russet potato. And you know, here you can see just more of those uh, sort of white heads, shall we say. And I don't know what those are. And uh, I'll inform you if there are any changes or anything tries to emerge from those or are they just a natural part or feature of the plant. Okay, it's day 35 of this sweet potato germination experiment. And this sweet potato plant is 40 centimeters tall, roughly, from the sand line. So it's very tall. Um, the growth has been phenomenal. And, you know, I said this last time, but, you know, the growth in the last 72 hours or so has been just enormous compared to what it was before. So all those meristems are hard at work generating a lot of new leaf primordia, new leaves. And by comparison, this is the size of the new shoot, and that's tiny. So this first sprout has a huge first mover's advantage. It has probably leached a lot of nutrients from this sweet potato tuber. And the second one probably doesn't get enough water. So I can try spraying it again. Um, seems to have two leaves. I'll zoom in on that. So here's a close-up of that second sprout. And you know these are... I'm not sure. I mean they kind of look like true leaves, but they should be the cotyledons. But you know, maybe this is just another case, just like ginger, where the cotyledons are tiny, uh, well not quite microscopic, but you just can't really see them. They could be just really underdeveloped because this plant in its uh, evolutionary history just did not need to have big cotyledons or even really even need them functionally because it just has this huge tuberous root to supply the growing plants with so much energy. So as far as these leaves are concerned, um, there's a lot of grains of sand on them. I want to wash that off and do sort of a demo video on that, but anyway. Um, you know, once upon a time, I looked at the two oldest true leaves and I thought they were cotyledons because they're kind of uh, convex instead of concave and they were no longer shiny. But the truth is, that's how all leaves progress. So, if you look at this leaf, it's uh, a little more shiny. If you look down there, they're kind of dull. So, I don't really know what happens. You know, the wax kind of goes away after the leaves get stretched out so to speak so you know these uh, new leaves behind are all kind of waxy and shiny and folded up but as soon as they get mature and uh, grow to their maximal size or 
I don't know what the maximal size is, but for now it appears to be kind of like this one, then uh, they just kind of lose their luster and curl a different way. So I think it's time I took a leaf measurement. I don't think this needs to be an everyday thing, but you know, I just want to give you an idea of how big these leaves are in some sense of scale. So, you know, the leaf size is slightly in excess of uh, four inches in length. That would be 10 centimeters. You go metric. Uh, this tape measure, unfortunately, is in the British Imperial system. So if I unfold these leaves, you know, I would say about eight to 8.5 centimeters across. And these leaves are just sort of like um, spade shape, just like in honeydew. Except, um, yeah, actually they're they're very similar to honeydew leaves. The veinage is a little different, and you know these tips are more pointed. Whereas in honeydew, the leaves are more rounded and they're covered in little hairs. So what I want to do now is demonstrate how I'm getting rid of some of these sand particles, but at the same time I'm also sort of watering these plants through the top. So I'm just using you know, a concentrated jet instead of a spray. And that's really just for aesthetic purposes. And finally, I'm just gonna do some spray on that sprout so it can uh, grow a little bit more and we can observe. Basically, because there's not much water, we're sort of observing in slow motion how that um, second sprout is growing. So one issue that's crossed my mind is, you know, is the sweet potato plant allosterically inhibiting through the use of uh, chemicals emitted by its roots, the germination of the russet potato and the gold potato, because those are only very, very distantly related species. So it's possible that it's inhibiting their growth. It's very funny that they haven't grown. Okay, so I took this uh, toothbrush not sort of a wrapper, but uh, you know, the container for a new toothbrush. I kind of cut off the end and made this into not a funnel, but sort of a trowel that can direct water in so I can water more easily. So that's a lot of water that just went in there about. Um, 0.75 liters so this plant spot tray isn't even near being full and I'm gonna water some more so I think I may have watered a total of 1.2 liters and I don't know if you noticed but towards the end uh, I basically drowned a fungus gnat or two so hopefully if these fungus gnats are seeking refuge in that tray, they'll just drown in there eventually. Or if they're emerging from the soil underneath, hopefully they'll all mostly drown. Um, because this fungus gnat problem is really getting to me. I don't want to use powerful pesticides indoors on these potted plants. But I'll uh, never take that off the table as an option because there are just way too many of those.